The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you need to clear the way to a new and full life with God? That's our question this Lent. And as familiar as the story from the Gospel may sound to our ears, I must confess that I always find this story, especially as it's told by John, to be just a little bit too jarring, feeling disjointed and fragmented. The other evangelists will place this account at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry rather than at the beginning where John would place this, moving Jesus in and out of Jerusalem throughout his ministry as some sort of commuter to Jerusalem. In the other Gospels, this is a pivotal moment for the order of the day and how they look at Jesus. 
But John seems to have another direction, stressing the message rather than the journey itself. As familiar as it is to recall this scene and even the effect of Jesus, I believe that John would have us stress the meaning that is found within the narrative and beyond the story itself. It is almost too easy to picture Jesus arriving at the temple, which has been reduced to a simple, the temple, with no capitalization to it at all, and at least thinking and proclaiming aloud, who are you kidding? What are you really doing here? That's what we would want to see Jesus saying. In the narrative of Jesus, even at his birth, so much of the faith of God's people has been reduced to seemingly empty religiosity. That is, rituals that are repeated and even handed down, but which lack both the depth and connection to what they're representing with their relationship with God. This is perhaps best seen in Luke's account of Jesus being presented in the temple. In this scene, Mary and Joseph prepared to offer a sacrifice in honor of their newborn son, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons for those who could not afford a sheep. There is already an economy of sorts happening in the temple. And just to make it convenient, you could buy your sacrifice right there as you enter. There's no need to lug those smelly animals around with you. The particularities and customs are already overshadowing the spirit of the worship itself. Now the narrative leads me to ask, as if it was really a matter of what you intended to buy for that sacrifice, really indicate how strong your faith was or wasn't? But what is clear is that the obstacles are suddenly in the way to God and practicing one's faith fully and rightly, being reduced instead to some sort of economy we have to practice in. So who were they kidding? Was it really at the heart of what they did, that economy? But how about us today? The problem of obscuring the intention, what happens when we set off to do one thing and then become waylaid, or even the particularities and customs and rules for how, when, and where we do things and by whom, it happens more often than we probably care to admit, sometimes so subtly that we don't even notice for a while until the situation gets out of hand completely, seemingly having taken on a life of its own. And suddenly we find ourselves doing something simply because we've always done it that way. But it lacks the depth and connection. So once again in Lent is an opportunity to ask the question, who are we kidding? What are we really trying to do? How often don't we have an answer for those questions? One example from my own experience occurred while I was working in Japan, my first job out of college. I was the guest of a client for golf on three occasions while living in Japan. While we kind of take that for granted, and those were kind of fascinating experiences, suffice to say, golfing in Japan is a big deal. It's more than simply a game or a sport. It's more than just a golf round. There are protocols, there are customs, there are traditions you have to master. It is a ceremony of sorts. And one of which that's the most jarring is the fact that you don't carry your own clubs, you have a caddy. And not just a caddy. It's not a teenager. It's a little old lady carrying your clubs. And I was a little taken aback for a little old lady to carry my bag around for 18 holes. But again, custom dictates. We've always done it this way. Well, silly me, at the end of the golf game, I thought you would show your appreciation, give a gratuity. But no, 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 no. The custom of the day is to offer a gift, a gift. I don't even know this person. What is he supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to go to the snack bar that sells the appropriate gifts, depending on how much you like to show your appreciation. Everything from a box of laundry detergent to a CD player. Why those items? I really don't know. It was considered to be in bad taste to hand that kind of service person cash, or in this case, yen, it, to give them an object was somehow from the heart giving it to them and they received it, only to go behind the snack bar and sell it back and get the yen or the cash. So who are we kidding? What are they really trying to do here? What are we doing in our own faith, our customs, our religiosity, our piety? One of the amazing aspects of this season of Lent is to ask, what am I really doing? In addition to providing clarity of where or who we are, where we're headed on that journey of faith that comes into question. So what are you doing that does not help you on your way? 
is something obscuring your path? What is it you need to live a, a new and full life with God? And all too often, I'm afraid the answer simply is, I don't know, I got nothing. You may realize that somehow the path has become obscured, and somewhere along the way, you got waylaid. So Lent, with its special spiritual disciplines, becomes a great gift, an intentional, explicit time to examine and form or reform that journey, that relationship with God. Lent is a specific time within our church year in which you're invited and encouraged to ask, what am I really doing with my faith in my life? It may, be, it may even beg the question, who was I kidding? More than just an occasion to reflect, Lent becomes more of a specific time to restart or start altogether a deeper and connective life with God. So what are those things that you need to clear away from God's temple that is in your life? to overturn the money changers, so to speak, and form your heart or your mind. Looking back at our gospel story today, Jesus did more than just clear away. He overturned. He liberated. And probably not in the manner that would work for our own lives, but it does, I believe, present a powerful metaphor that we need to grasp and live into. But let's make no mistake. Money is talked about in the gospels more than any other worry or desire. And throughout history, money has been attributed to power. As Jesus overturned the money changers' tables, he was also overturning the power and desire, it seems, to rule the wills of what is done, by whom, where, and when. Perhaps that is applied even more so for us today. What do we need to overturn? What has power or is essential to clearing the way to God that is obscuring our path? What is in your life that has so much power and is getting in the way of who you are fully as the child of God? How do you clear away that which obscures your own faith journey? To help one another discover or rediscover what it is that we need to have that life with God, that fuller life that is balanced and complete, allows us to live our lives with others fully as well. For what makes our Christian faith so very different than other faiths is what we learn for ourselves helps to shape, inform, even reform what we consider to be community. It's more than our life alone. The more we grow in our faith, the more we grow towards a love and life that is selfless, life for the sake of that other. It seems that anywhere we look in Holy Scripture, there is this persistent calling to each of us away from what we have been alone into that new and fuller life with God, more completely. So will you clear away what is in the way of your path? I believe it's time to overturn the tables of our own merchants, those things that would otherwise have kept us buying the same old fear or sense of inadequacy, self-doubt or guilt, or anything else that has waylaid us along the way, and realize that new and full life that beckons as we follow Jesus the way of love. Amen. The prayers of the people for today is Form 4. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good, especially Harrison, Matt, Becky, Jennifer, Steve, Stephen, Philip, and Tony, for their safety as well as the just use of the power that is placed in their hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Especially Abby, Alex, Ann, B, Bunny, Jacob, Jane, Janet, Jimmy, Lana, Lily, Lou, Mary, Nancy, Pearson, Penny, Richard, Ryan, Susan, and all those affected by natural disasters and human tragedies, especially remembering the people of Ukraine and the Holy Land at this time. And we pray for the first responders and the aid and relief efforts that continue there and around the world, as well as our shut-in parishioners and their caregivers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to you your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and that we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us together pray for our Stephen ministers. Loving God, inspire each of us to reach out during this Lenten season of transformation to those facing life changes and challenges. Guide and empower our Stephen ministers and leaders as they provide spiritual companionship to those in need of support and understanding. And in prayerful consideration, may you give those who feel they or someone close to them would benefit from a care-receiving relationship the courage to ask for a Stephen minister to walk alongside them. Look mercifully on this, your family, Almighty God, that by your great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.